reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, that's on page 206 in the New Testament. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. May the Lord bless this, the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Our second lesson comes from the fourth chapter of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. All thanks and praise be to God for his word in our lives. May God add to our hearing his blessing that we may gain greater understanding.
throughout the majority of my life, and this started when I was an adolescent because this was the ritual in our home, throughout the majority of my life I would say that I have seen the great majority of State of the Union addresses. I've seen enough to know what the drill is. And the ritual goes like this. The President of the United States, whoever that person is, stands up and in some fashion or another announces to the body that the United States is as good as it's ever been. And everybody gets up and claps. And that's the last time everybody gets up and claps. <laughs> because from that point on, the President, and this is totally nonpartisan, it goes both ways, and we've seen it both ways, the President gets up and expounds upon the accomplishments of his administration, which half the body likes and half the body doesn't. And so, as you're watching, of course, the visual is the president of the podium, and then the vice president, whose job it is to stand up every time and clap, and then the speaker of the house, depending on the party, of course, is the speaker of the same party as the president, the speaker leaps up too. If the speaker is not the same party of the president, then the speaker just does not get up and looks pretty stone-faced in the process. And then the camera pans out over the whole chamber, and of course you know that the Supreme Court justices aren't going to stand up because that's not proper, and the Joint Chiefs aren't going to stand up because that's not proper, but then everybody else is standing up and down depending on their party affiliation and whether or not they liked what they just heard. And then of course we know when the First Lady gets introduced, everybody stands up, and that's one time when everybody is together again standing up and clapping. And so this is the State of the Union drill. And yeah, it's, um, it's partisan politics. It's the President of the United States, whatever party, his, whatever party he's from. It's, it's him getting up and putting forward his particular platform that's in accordance with the ideology of the party he represents. And you get to see played out every year in the State of the Union, the dividedness of the leadership of our nation. And of course, it looks kind of silly that you got this little gamemanship going in the chambers where some people are standing and cheering and some people aren't because of the ideologies they hold and whether they agree or disagree with the President of the United States. But we've seen it over and over again. We know what it is. And all I got to say is, thank God the Church of Jesus Christ isn't divided like that. We, we know, yeah. <laughs> we know, we know better. In the course of my career in ministry, I've had the occasion where I've had to preside over a Presbyterian process called an administrative commission that had to be in dialogue and negotiation with three different churches, and this is over a long period of time, three different churches that were choosing to leave the denomination. And let me tell you what, that's a process, and it's a painful process. And I always wonder why the heck I said yes to this chore when we're in the middle of it, because it is something that I really don't like doing. Because in those negotiations, in those dialogues, all the, all the differences come out. All the divisiveness comes forward. And over time, out of those three churches that I, had to, I was appointed to negotiate with, uh, uh, two left and one decided to stay, so I, I've, I'm not on the winning side of that. But uh, we did convince one church to stay. And amidst all the division and all the different issues and stuff, I remember the moment when they decided. Because they put their stuff forward, and I looked at them as the chair of this commission, and I said, I realize that. I realize that we have, all have differences of opinion here. But the bottom line is this. We love you, 
and we don't want you to go. And they took a recess and went out <laughs> of the room and talked it over and came back and made a decision not to pursue the process they were in. It only happened once. The other two times, it didn't happen. Didn't even give me a chance to do that part. Indeed, you know this as a congregation. You've been through it. You know what the pain is. You've been there. You've walked that journey. We all know too well. This is a church that began as a division. And in its 50-year-plus history, it has had two splits since the original split that began it. You know this story. This is a human story. It's a human story that we can't avoid. It's a human story we can't avoid at the State of the Union address in Washington, D.C. It is a story we can't avoid in the conduct of our churches, whatever denomination and tradition they may be. And it is a story you know even in your own family lives. This is what it is to be human. And this is the situation that the Apostle Paul addressed 2,000 years ago when he says to these divided Corinthians, these Corinthians, this is one of the first churches ever founded in the name of Christ. And they were already splitting up and becoming divided and struggling mightily over their differences. And Paul has to deal with some of that stuff, some of those issues, some of that mess. He gets into it. He gets his hands dirty. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And then he gets to this statement. But we have this treasure in clay jars. And everybody knew what he was talking about. Clay jars were the means by which you stored your food. If those clay jars broke, those fragile jars that stored your food, that meant your food got spilled out all over the ground. And for a poor people in an ancient time, that food inside those jars represented life. And you did everything in your power to hang on to that life and preserve it and make sure it was kept safe so all would have it and be able to share and experience life together. And Paul is making that reference, that same kind of analogy in regard to our lives as the children of God. That inside of us is life. Life that's been breathed into us by the power of God. But that life is encapsulated by these fragile clay jars. And so when we think about the divisiveness of humanity and all that we go through at any level anywhere, the fact of the matter is, it's not so much differences and divisiveness as it is just realizing all of us as individuals and we as community are but clay jars. And we can be cracked and broken by this imperfect life. And the danger is that that precious treasure inside, that life that is breathed in by God, can spill all over the ground. And we lose it. But Paul is telling this particular community, there's a better way. And that better way is to remember, to remember, to strive for this, and never forget that that treasure comes to us from the extraordinary power that belongs to God and not to us. And that does give us the strength and the power so that we may be afflicted, but we are never crushed. We may be perplexed and confused by this world, but we're never driven to despair. We may be persecuted for our faith and for that for which we stand, and yet we are never forsaken. And we may be struck down in this life, but we are never destroyed. 
Paul is giving the Corinthians in these words the very promise of God that belongs to all of us into whom God has breathed life. And so he says to those Corinthians, and he says to us generations later, seize the treasure. Find it within yourself. Never let go. And not only find that treasure within yourself, see that treasure inside others. No matter how divided you may be, no matter how much you struggle and fret and wrestle around with the differences between us, see the treasure inside that other clay jar because those clay jars will not last. And what will last, what lives forever, is what God breathes into us, nothing else. And that means every issue in this imperfect life that we hold dear. The State of the Union address by the President of the United States at any point in time is never about the kingdom of God. It is about the kingdom of this earth and how well it can move forward being what it is imperfectly. And yes, there may be some values mentioned there that have something to do with the kingdom of God, but it does not define the kingdom of God by any stretch of the imagination. That is something entirely different, and it's breathed into our very souls. And so on this day of our annual church meeting, it's important also to share the state of the church that we may learn how to seize our treasures better. And so, as I speak, you may stand up and clap and others may not. Who knows? <laughs> no. There's some things I think that we do need to share in the life of this church that are important to share. And the first thing I would say is that Covenant Presbyterian Church is a community of faith that cares about each other. You know, the deacons have developed the program of the shepherds and the flocks now. All members of this church are divided into flocks, and you have a deacon who is your shepherd, and your deacons contact you and let you know that they're the shepherd, and they're not there to stick their nose into your life, but they're there to care about you and let you know you're cared about in the life of this church. And they do work very hard, and they report back, and and, and they want to improve that process so that it builds the fellowship amongst us so no one feels left out. And if you have concerns as people in the church, you have struggles that you are facing and you feel all alone, besides just the pastor, there are, there are shepherds that you can mention that to for prayer and for support to help the upbuilding of this body of Christ. And we're thankful that the deacons have been willing to go the extra mile and begin this ministry in our midst. And we know it's starting to uh, have, have an impact because deacons are, have, are reporting that they've been getting Christmas cards from people in their flock. Let me, let me tell you, it's the deacon's job to send you a Christmas card, but now you're sending your deacon a Christmas card. That's a great thing. That's the back and forth of Christian fellowship that's supposed to happen. We also have a ministry called Stephen Ministry in this church, and our banner is up there, Love One Another as I Have Loved You. And the Stephen Ministry is a ministry of friendship, one-on-one. -on -one. If you're lonely and alone and you need somebody to walk a journey with you, there are Stephen ministers to do that with you. Unfortunately, we always have more Stephen ministers than we have people who are, who are wanting that kind of assistance and help, and we need to hear from you. If you're alone and lonely, if you feel like you are all alone in a struggle in life, the Stephen ministers are trained to walk that journey with you. They're not going to solve all your problems. They're going to be a friend in the journey. They're going to listen because that's another ministry that enhances our fellowship and who we are as the body of Christ. We are a body that's constantly seeking to discern itself. 
You discern me, I discern you, we, we discern each other. And discerning means we acknowledge your presence, we acknowledge our differences, but also our similarities, and we acknowledge and we value those things that you value as well. And so as you know, in this past year, we've introduced a little bit of different music in worship. And the reason, you know, some may still wonder what the reason is, the reason is because as we discern this worshiping body, what we come to realize is that there are different people with different needs in the worship of God. And so we don't take anything away, but we add two so that everyone has a chance to feel included and connected. And yes, there's some things that may not turn you on. And when they don't, your reaction shouldn't be to walk out, as a few have. Your reaction is to look around the room while that's happening and see the people who are being uplifted by that aspect of worship and thank God for it. Because we are to call to be a people who discern each other and our needs. So we are a community of faith that cares about each other. We are a church also that cares about those outside our walls. In our local mission efforts, in our world mission, and even in our vacation Bible school mission projects, and the youth just this past week went to Mission Peniel to look outside ourselves and see those things and those places that God calls us to. Covenant Presbyterian Church is a congregation that values its international, international, intergenerational relationships. We took a risk, as Meg told us, and we hired a youth director. And we have a youth committee because that was a need we recognized. And we had to make a choice. We can become a, an entirely retirement church just like that. It wouldn't be hard. But there's others amongst us, and we want them with us. We want the full mix. We want the growth that can only come from people at different stages and views and perspectives of life. It takes a commitment from all of us. It doesn't magically happen, but it does take a risk, and this church took it. And our budget hasn't come up to the risk yet, but we're working on it. Covenant Presbyterian Church is a church that's committed to unity and diversity. I just heard this week of the death of a scholar whose many books I have read and who I heard, have heard in person speak a number of times, Dr. Mar Marcus Borg. And he is a theologian that theologically always pushes the envelope. There was a time in this church's history when his books were banned from this church, which is always a shame. When a Presbyterian church starts burning books on the courthouse steps, that's a problem. Unity and diversity means we don't ban books, we don't ban ideas, we don't ban conversations. It means we engage with each other because we realize that the God of the heart is also the God of the mind and the God of the spirit. And we are called to use all in our lives of faith. But most importantly, Covenant Presbyterian Church is the body of Christ and the treasure inside these clay jars is finally and ultimately all about compassion and grace, forbearance, mercy, justice, and love. That is because those are the things that were modeled by Jesus Christ himself and so given to each and every one of us. People who visit here, by the way, tell me who you are. They know who you are because they tell me how welcomed they have felt. They like going out in the courtyard, especially when we have some event out there, and they come to me last week, and visitors came to me and said, this is a wonderful place. The fellowship is great. I've been greeted. I've been accepted. I've been loved. A couple said, I'll be back. And that's wonderful to hear. That's good news. And so I would just say, 
that in the almost three years that I've been here now as a pastor, it has been a great honor and a privilege to be your pastor and go this journey because you are the church simply because you know how to be the church, to live by the leading of the Spirit and to love each other and to love God. And I thank you for that. And may God continue to bless our journey together. Amen.